The world of Norman Rockwell is a world of immense grandeur, beauty, and serenity. Summer gardens in the Berkshire Hills. The small town of Stockbridge is charming. As seen through the paintbrush of Norman Rockwell, the artist, picturesque is a fitting description of where he lived and where he worked. Stockbridge, Massachusetts now calls home to the museum which bears his name. Rockwell's world is seen through many eyes. Children being children. Neighbors listening to a returning soldier. Elderly enjoying their evening music in the back room of a barber shop. You and I can imagine an old red barn on an autumn afternoon that later became his studio, an idyllic place to weave a rich story of hearth and home and studio. But it is also more than that. Rockwell's world can also be a a complex, complicated wrestling with who and what we are, the less noble sides of our national story. The struggle to make sense of a diverse people with different agendas, different skin colors, and different religious expressions New understandings that long eluded Rockwell until later in his life. These are the different Norman Rockwells we see when we look at his art. This is what our retrospective will consider here. Let's begin with seeing the Rockwell most of us might be familiar with. Norman Rockwell was born and raised in New York City in 1894. He discovered a love for drawing. At age 14, he decided to take classes at the New School of Art in New York City. In 1916, when he was 22, he began a 47-year collaboration with the weekly magazine Saturday Evening Post. And Boy's Life, where he hired on as its art director, still in his teens? Magazines and newspapers were the main stream of communication back then. Magazines, however, could do what newspapers could not do, print captivating color imagery on a weekly basis. That's just what Rockwell wanted to create, what he was trained for, just where he wanted to be professionally. We could argue Norman Rockwell was made for these moments, and millions of readers would agree. His artwork graced the covers of those weekly magazines. Over 320 editions of the Saturday Evening Post. When his career had ended, he could count more than four thousand illustrations and paintings. They still speak to us. Twenty thousand photographs, including those which document the steps of preparation for his paintings, have now been archived. This photo made by his assistant 
helped Rockwell formulate his final thinking of the painting we know as before the shot. When we look at a painting or a picture or a magazine illustration by Norman Rockwell, we can see a bit of ourselves in each one. The title of Deborah Solomon's recent biography nails it, American Mirror, The Life and Art of Norman Rockwell. For instance, we see ourselves at home and overseas spreading good cheer. We see a place where children can be silly, and so can adults. When our pets are the center of attention, or our attention is somewhere else. We see a place where we can dream and even perhaps imagine what it means to grow up. Sometimes we might need some help. We might consider small victories along the way. Or a day when victories are elusive. Norman Rockwell was this and so much more. I'd like to show you two paintings he made for his publishers for our consideration. One is entitled Triple Portrait. It was painted in 1960. Notice we are looking at three different Norman Rockwells. He chose this concept for an image when his publisher invited him to start work on his autobiography. A light-hearted, if not self-deprecating view of himself. But notice the hints and clues of visual language that he left for our consideration. Knowing how fastidious and clean and organized Rockwell kept his studio. Look at the objects he has depicted. Paintbrushes lay scattered about on the floor. A glass of Coca-Cola on the red stool to his left. Any moment now, it will tip over and spill sticky syrup onto his clean, shiny floor. On his easel, top right, he has taped pictures of well-known artists from different eras of art history who painted self-portraits that art historians understand now are some of the finest self-portraits ever made. Albrecht Dürer, Renaissance master, seen here depicted himself in 1498 in fashionable professional attire. The attire for Rockwell? He has a cleaning rag hanging out his back pocket. Rembrandt, one of the great painters of the 17th century Dutch Golden Age, is known to have painted his self-portrait over 90 different times. Those would include drawings and sketchings, Rockwell's self-portraits. Well, you can count them on one hand. Pablo Picasso's 1929 version of a self-portrait is abstract expressionism. He makes no attempt to depict any observable figures. 
That's a far cry from Norman Rockwell's style. Norman Rockwell once said, if a picture's not going very well, I'll just put a puppy in it. Vincent van Gogh, late 19th century self-portrait scene here, is actually a reversal of what Rockwell has shown. Perhaps Rockwell is saying, I won't even try to match this masterpiece. Look at the other hints that Rockwell leaves us. His eyeglasses. Rockwell once explained why his glasses look opaque. He said, I had to show that my glasses were fogged and that I couldn't actually see what I looked like. A homely, lanky fellow. And therefore, I could stretch the truth just a bit and paint myself looking more suave and debonair than I actually am. Do you see the ancient Greek helmet resting atop his canvas? He purchased it on a trip to Paris one year. He was looking for a helmet as a prop, something that a soldier from the ancient classical world would have worn. When he carried it back to his hotel room, he stopped to watch a firefighter working to save a burning building, he then realized that all French firemen wore helmets identical to the one he had just paid a lot of money for. Rockwell is gently reminding himself and perhaps his viewer not to be taken in by appearances. There's one final bit of humor, I think, that he intentionally makes we should include. Do you see the garbage can on his right? Do you see the wisp of smoke rising from the paint rags, which have caught fire? They're burning because of hot ashes that he had spilled from his pipe onto the rags? May 1943. His studio, his studio burned to the ground in the middle of the night. Rockwell is able to capture that unforgettable event in this delightful drawing. Rockwell could make fun of even the most serious moments and tragic events that people might experience. He said refreshingly when it was over, this will just give me a new start to look at my work and perhaps take it in a new direction. The second painting I'd like for us to look at is entitled Breaking Home Ties. A quint essential truth we all might identify with in our own journey of self-discovery, and coming of age. Rockwell painted this for the September 25th, 1954 cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Rockwell used multiple sketches to get the right tone and feeling. I think breaking home ties is one of his finest paintings. The father is taking his son to the train station near home and is preparing to bid his son goodbye. The son is heading off to college. The adult world is beckoning him and his face reveals both a hint of smile as well as a face of some anxiety. We know the feeling. Gone are the innocent days of childhood play and fun-filled games. 
now the young boy is becoming a man, and the father both acknowledges that reality and tries to pretend not to be affected by it. What I like is the emotional poignancy Rockwell evokes. Together, father and son sit on a running board of an old beat-up truck. They await together the imminent arrival of the train at a rural whistle stop. The red flag and lantern you seen here on the left will signal the train to pick up one solitary passenger. The boy's packed suitcase identifies his destination. The State University decal on the suitcase is unmistakable. He is wearing his best suit. Crisp white shirt with colored tie and socks to match. The awkwardly worn new tie may suggest his fashion statement is a new experience. And so the two wait in silence. One is looking bright-eyed to the future. The other is holding on to the past. Look at their front pockets. The father's front pocket holds his tobacco, a habit formed who knows how many years ago. But look at the son's front pocket. It holds a yellow train ticket, a ticket to the future. The father is indeed having a hard time letting go. He holds two hats. His hat is functional. It's wide-brimmed, designed to shield him from sun and rain. The son's hat is designed for people to see, a new Stetson with a colored band for decoration. Notice the father is not yet willing to hand his son's hat to him just yet. Reluctance pervades this painting everywhere we look. The father still hasn't lit his cigarette. The match in his right hand is the clue. Crowded together on a beat-up, uncomfortable metal seat, they sit side by side, but notice their knees gently touch. Body language is subtly suggested by Rockwell. Their eyes look in opposite directions. The sons, they search for the train whose whistle he's just heard. The father's eyes turn away. He can't look over there. The son sits eagerly upright. The father is resigned and bent over. You see what's in the son's hand? In his hands we see a wrapped lunch. It is perhaps tied affectionately by his mother who has just made him some lunch on the train. It is adorned with the pink bow. When you look at an earlier preliminary sketch for this final oil painting, this preliminary sketch of pencil on paper is one that Rockwell shows he has wrestled with how to depict the mother's presence. We see gently her looking the son's way. She holds the sandwich. Rockwell ultimately chose to heighten the drama by removing her altogether. Only the lunch bag remains, and the son protects that in his hands.
Parting, said Shakespeare, is such sweet sorrow. I feel that when I look at this artwork. A young boy, now becoming a man, and letting go is both sad and sweet, as they all recognize and they all acknowledge. The only one who is unable to see, see all that is their beloved dog. The dog knows that the parting is one that is only filled with sadness, and he is not yet ready to let his best friend go. This is one powerful work of art. Somewhere along the way, Norman Rockwell made significant changes in his thinking and his working. The approach to his craft was revisited. His subject matter, his topics, his views that informed his imagery, they all noticeably begin to shift. Issues of social change, issues of race and color become more pronounced. Rockwell's awareness as an artist to address those issues soon reached a tipping point. The awakening of Norman Rockwell, as one writer, Tom Carson, recently put it, is now unfolding. It's hard to say exactly why and when this took place. We have seen images of black Americans before. This painting, entitled Boy in a Dining Car, was made in 1946. But the picture of the black man as the dining car attendant was part of the publisher's decision to limit the number of black people seen on the cover of their magazine at Saturday Evening Post. Rockwell was not permitted to depict people of color unless they were in servile or menial roles. The emerging civil rights movement challenged those sentiments. Rockwell felt them. He decided in 1963 to leave Saturday Evening Post, and he went to work at Look Magazine. Look Magazine was glad to have Rockwell with them. The cover of their magazine addressed issues of segregation that Rockwell was interested in tackling. This Rockwell painting is entitled New Kids in Town. It would not have been possible at the Post. Here, segregated neighborhoods, like this one in Chicago, are portrayed in a positive light. Notice how Rockwell deftly switches symbols of color as seen in this picture. You see the black dog on the right? Look for the white cat on the left. They have become symbols of integration. Black pet with white people. White pet with black people. I don't think that's an accident. When six years old Ruby Bridges 
was taken by your parents to an all-white school. The date was November 14, 1960. Federal marshals were called in to escort her safely to and from a New Orleans elementary school. White vitriol made that a challenge. Rockwell has placed Ruby Bridges at the center of our attention in this story. His model was a young girl named Linda Gunn. She, with her father seen here, helped make this moment come to life in art. Rockwell's attention to detail helps capture this moment. In the painting, Ruby's right foot is in motion. You see her stepping forward. The photo of Linda, the model, shows us how Rockwell helped the model by positioning a board beneath the shoe. She can rest her foot at a natural angle. That board helped stabilize the tedious process of keeping a young child still. Notice the federal marshals. Rockwell has them marching in step. Feet and hands and arms and legs, they all move simultaneously. Badges and armbands are shown prominently. A federal court order on a piece of paper is visible in the pocket of the lead agent on the left. I like this photograph. Norman Rockwell himself is showing the four men how their movements should be understood. There is graffiti on the wall. It speaks of racist hatred. Colors of red are splashed on that wall. Rockwell's decision to omit the faces of the four marshals was a rich insight. That omission helps us to maintain our focus on Ruby. She carries her notebooks, her pencils, and her ruler. Ruby is wearing her Sunday best. Her white dress shines in the sunlight. Dignity and courage are part of her presence. When President Obama entered the White House after his 2008 election, he requested this painting be loaned for viewing at the White House. He invited Ruby Bridges to be part of these ongoing conversations and to be a part of this special moment. The title of this painting is The Problem We All Live With. Sometimes titles are vague. Sometimes titles are misleading. Sometimes Painters change their mind about titles, and some paintings have no titles at all. But not here. This title, The Problem We All Live With, is spot on. Rockwell reminds us the problem is one that belongs to all of us. I'd like to conclude with one historical event from 1964 that 
I think, truly captures Rockwell's sense of social responsibility as an artist. Three civil rights workers in Mississippi, college students Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, were murdered in June of 1964 by the KKK. The story was riveting. Rockwell began work on this painting for Look magazine during this time. The finished oil painting that he made, seen here, was entitled Murder in Mississippi. Rockwell captured the traumatic events as best he could. The brutal crime, its cover-up, its investigation, and the subsequent legal proceedings took months for the facts to be determined. Rockwell shows us a scene of a barren, isolated rural area. The illumination comes from automobile headlights we cannot see. When the Look magazine article appeared on June 29, 1965, the image selected was not the finished oil painting. What the editors chose was the early monochrome sketch with a hint of red. All we see are the shadows cast by the KKK vigilantes and local law enforcement with them. None of their images are visible. Rockwell's oil painting inspired the editors to delete them and focus solely on the victims. Rockwell had two images in his mind to guide him as he began to design his composition. The first image was a dramatic photograph that he had noticed in a news story in 1962, which was covering a revolution in South America. The photograph you see would go on to win the Pulitzer Prize the next year. We see a priest holding a dying soldier in his arms during a vicious street battle in Venezuela. The priest's name was Luis Padillo. The photographer's name was Hector Lovera. So powerful was this image for Rockwell that he chose it as the basis for his composition. You can see the similarities. They are not easy to look at. The second image, I think, that influenced Rockwell is a painting from 1814 by Francisco Goya. This painting commemorates the Spanish resistance to Napoleon's armies during the War of 1808 in Spain. We see Goya's use of light. The faceless shooters. The dark of night. The barren landscape. The muted colors. Beams of light illumine the victims. 
All of these visual components I've just shared with you lend, I think, inspiration for Rockwell's artistic interpretation. This work is unlike anything we have seen him do before. A remarkable change in his subject matter from just a few years earlier. The way he chooses to give this work its poignancy and its meaning. The curators at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, help us grasp the enormity of his creative output. They help us see the art he left us, his willingness and ability to speak directly to seminal issues of his day. Our best side, as well as our worst. I'd like to conclude with words from the Rockwell Museum. Who but someone who spent 64 years winning our hearts by reminding us of who we are, who could better advise us on treating others as we would like to be treated ourselves? Thank you for watching.